It's a great, great special there. You should open your Bibles up to Esther chapter 5. Actually, Esther chapter 4. Esther chapter 4. Favorite quotes. I know, I guess most people in here would have a favorite quote. You might not think about it every day, but, and if I gave you some time, you might be able to remember what it is. Um, I've listed 10 here that I found that, I'm not saying all of these are my favorite, but they are definitely famous quotes. Albert Einstein said, I have no special talent. I am only passionately curious. I like that. I like that. Don't count the days, make the days count. Muhammad Ali said that. Benjamin Franklin said, well done is better than well said. That'll preach. To be or not to be, that is the question. William Shakespeare. Early to bed and early to rise makes, one, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. wise. Benjamin Franklin. Albert Einstein is the one that uh, made the statement, and I do like this one. I've used it uh, in preaching before, but insanity. What is insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. <laughs> Uh, that was made by Damien. <laughs> no, that's Muhammad Ali. Henry Ford said, if you think you can do the right thing or think you can't do it, do the right thing, you're right. Einstein again. The only thing that interferes with my learning is my education. Do you get it though? The only thing that interferes with my learning is my education. How often we sit back on our education and say, I know all about that. There's nothing, there's nothing you can teach me about that. I know all about that. A man named Jonathan Ive made the statement, good is the enemy of great. And I, I hate the statement, uh, you know, oh, that's good enough. Now, there are times when we can make that statement, and it's okay. But in the work of God, mm -mm. good is never good enough. And good's the enemy of great. I'm going to give you one this morning that I, that I really love. And as, as a way of introducing our, our sermon. One of my favorites was offered by Winston Churchill in his speech made on June 18, 1940, entitled, Their Finest Hour. To every man there comes in his lifetime that special moment when he is figuratively tapped on the shoulder and offered a chance to do a very special thing, unique to him and fitted to his talents. What a tragedy if that moment finds him unprepared or unqualified for the work which would be his finest hour. I want to read it again. To every man there comes in his lifetime that special moment when he is figuratively tapped on the shoulder and offered a chance to do a special thing, unique to him and fitted to his talents. What a tragedy if that moment finds him unprepared or unqualified for the work which would be his finest hour. We, we sang the song, Bow the Knee. And that was, you know, that was one where I had to get my handkerchief out. And I don't know where it went, so you better be careful over there.
Because as that song was being sung, I thought of a Savior that bowed to the will of His Father and went to the cross for us. And gave His all. Gave His life for us. And then I thought about us in this church as well as any other true church. How many are in the church this morning that have never bowed the knee to the will of God for their life? And, and I, don't, I don't say those words in a reprimanding way. I say those words in a... And it breaks my heart to know what you are missing. by not bowing down before the Savior and saying, whatever, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. I'm not here to scold you whatsoever. I'm here to say, you have no idea what you're missing. By not seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. By making God part of your life instead of the center of your life. And everything, your schedule, your resources, everything, your likes, your dislikes, revolve around Him. You don't know what you're missing. You don't know what you're missing. You think you're happy. But you don't know the level of happiness that God has for you if you would simply bow your knee. And my heart this morning hurts for you. We're going to look at somebody here this morning. The famous quotes, part of the introduction. That last five minutes are not in my notes. That's my heart. That's why I'm weeping this morning. And if I weep more through this sermon, that'll be why. It is for you and it is for your It is for your fullness that we give our lives. Look at Esther chapter 4 and verse 1. When Mordecai perceived that all that when Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put all put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried a loud and bitter cry and came even before the king the king's gate For none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews. And fasting and weeping and wailing. And many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Look at verse 13. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, 
Then shall there be then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Then Esther bade them return. Mordecai the answer, Go, gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. I want to bring you up to date here quickly to chapter 4. King Ahasuerus, the king of the, the Persian Empire at that time, had a wife named Vashti. He was having a big drunken feast one time. And you wonder... You wonder why, and I don't, look, I don't make a huge deal of it, although I probably should. You wonder why I'm against liquor and alcohol. Don't ever come to me and say, oh, I can show you Scripture. Don't, don't bring that fight to me. <laughs> a drunken party is what they were having, and he calls and sends for his wife, says, I want her to come in here and dance before all of these people that are here, all of my guests. And what's implied that there is a, is a strip tease. Come in and strip yourself naked before my friends. Hey, and she, what'd she say? I don't think so. I don't do that. And he basically excommunicated her. And I'm painting a very quick broad stroke here. And said, well, you're not my wife then. I'll find another wife. He searched the kingdom. Had all the most beautiful women brought into him. And Esther being one of them. And Esther, he chose Esther. Esther became his wife. Her name, it, her, her Jewish name is actually uh, Hadassah. Hadassah. Esther is a, is a Persian name that she was given. And so she became, she did not volunteer for it, but she was, she was brought in and she became his wife. Moving right along, she had a first cousin named Mordecai. Esther was a, an orphan, and her older first cousin, Mordecai, took her in and raised her. Mordecai found himself in a tight spot one day because Haman, now we introduced Haman into this. Haman was a, uh, one of uh, Ahasuerus' chief advisors, and they were treated with great respect and Wherever they went, people were to bow the knee. And Mordecai says, I, I, I follow the Lord. I bow the knee to no man. Haman passed him one day. Everybody bowed the knee except, you guessed it, Mordecai. And Haman, being full of himself, says, we'll fix him. I'm going to get him for that. He just trampled over my moment. He stepped on my pride. I'm going to get him for that. So he hatched a plan. You can read all of this. It'd be a good thing to do is to go back today. It won't take you that long. Read the entire book of Esther. So Haman says, I, I, Mordecai's a Jew. I'll go to the king. I'm going to convince the king to kill all the Jews. I'm not just going to kill him. I'm going to kill all the Jewish people. So he does. He goes to the king and he says, there is a group of people dispersed throughout your entire nation here, but they are rebellious people. They, they do not recognize you as being God and they will not follow your rules. They will not follow your commandments and they will rebel against you. I say that we go in and that we take them out. We annihilate them. We just, we just kill all the Jews in the, in the, uh, in the kingdom. Ahasuerus said, sounds like a good idea to me. That's going to be a problem if I don't take care of it. Of course, he was being misled. So now you have Esther, who is a Jew, is now in the falling under the same commandment that Mordecai is and all the rest of the Jews to be destroyed. 
So Mordecai gets word to Esther and says, and this is where we pick it up, says, I think you need to go to the king. You're his wife. Go to the king and, and use your position of influence because probably this is why you are where you are. If you've wondered throughout this whole process of having been chosen to be his queen, it's not something she sought understand. He said it's perhaps for, touch, for such a time as this. This is why you're here and this is what you are to do. And she agrees to do that. So that brings us up here really. And that kind of uh, covers the verses we read. This morning I'd like to specifically look at verse 14. I want to look at three truths present them to you this morning that hopefully, hopefully will encourage all of us in this room to seek to do the will of God for our lives. That will cause all of us to desire to bow down before Him. For all of us to look to God this morning and to say, okay, I am alive in the year 2022. On March... 27th, what, what is it that you have designed for me? What is the work that you have designed for me to do? Through, through, through the placement, through my entire history, you have brought me to this day and the future days in front of us. What is the thing that, that for such a time as this that I have been created? Point number one, I want you to understand something. Esther's refusal to fulfill her purpose does not obstruct God from doing His will. Satan thinks, I'm going to fight God and I'm going to ruin everything. And you know what Satan is? He's a pawn. How many of you play chess? How many of you know what chess pieces even look like? There's a lot more of you. The front line pieces are the little pawns. Right? You have castles and you have knights and you have bishops and you have a king and a queen and then it goes back again to bishops, knights, and castles. In front of them are the little pieces of, of no particular marking and they're called pawns. Satan is a pawn in the hand of God. And Satan never keeps God from accomplishing His will, His purpose. And listen, today, if you say, look, I'm just here because somebody expects me to be here this morning. I, I don't really care that much. I just I can't wait. I'm watching the clock. It's 11.56 right now, and we're going to go over again. If that's your spirit... And if you have no desire whatsoever, zero, to do the will of God, to figure out what that thing is at this time in history, in the history of mankind, we are alive right now for a purpose. And if you have no desire for that, let me tell you one person that is not fretting over it. God. God will just use somebody else. Now you might say, Wow, Pastor, I thought you were trying to talk me into doing this. Well, I'm going to. But I just want you to know that if you're bitter at God this morning, maybe bitterness is your problem. If you're angry with God this morning, maybe that's the issue. And if you say, I'll just get back at God, no. Kind of like bitterness and anger toward each other. It's like drinking poison and expect the other person to die from it. You and I will not keep God from doing His purpose. Who loses out? We do. We are the loser. We are the great loser in that game. 
Mordecai said to Esther, For thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time. In other words, if you don't choose to do this, if you don't choose to approach the king, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. He's saying God's going to deliver them because it's through the Jews that the Messiah is going to come. But you will not have played your part and you will be the one that loses out. Not God. Isaiah 55, 11, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I send it. Amen. You guys are very familiar with that verse, aren't you? Isaiah 46, 9 through 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. From a far country, yea, I have spoken it, I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it, I will also do it. If you're in a battle with God today, you're really not. He's not battling with you at all. To have His purposes, and well, he, He's got that figured out. And if you're not going to do it, somebody else is. But you and I are the ones that miss out on the eternal blessing of doing what God has chosen for us to do. Paul was a chosen vessel. But if Paul, if Paul were to have rejected on the road to Damascus that day to get saved, and if Paul were to have rejected the call of God upon his life to, to take the gospel as an apostle, to take the gospel to the Gentile people, guess what? God would have just had somebody else do it. And Paul would not have been Paul, the Paul that we know. He would have been the, he would have been the loser. When God purposed to deliver the Hebrews from Egypt, He chose Moses. But if Moses would have said, and he initially did say, I'm not going, but he finally gave in. But if he would have said, I'm not going, and if he would have stood by that, God would have delivered His people another way. When God purposed to destroy all mankind with a flood, make no mistake about it, Noah didn't just all of a sudden pop up one day. God prepared Noah for that time. If Noah would have said, I'm not building that ark, God would have said, fine, I'll just find me somebody else. And I could go on and on, but for time's sake I won't, but I could go on and on through the Bible and give you illustration after illustration after illustration of great people in the Bible, of people that are mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 that bowed the knee to God and said, I will do what you want me to do. I will answer the call for my life. And those are the people that we read about. The people that said, I'm in. I am so in. And they will be eternally grateful and, and glorified in heaven. Elijah sat by the brook Cherith after he had defeated, went to battle against the 400 uh, prophets of Baal and defeated them on Mount Carmel. He ran away, running from Jezebel. He found himself tired by the brook Cherith there. And he said to God, I guess I'm the only one left. And what was God's answer? No. Listen, pal, I have 7,000 more just like you working behind the scenes. You're not alone in this. That's why we gather. We gather on a Sunday morning to, for it to be reinforced in our minds that we are not alone in this thing called the Christian life, in this thing called glorifying God with our lives, in this thing called magnifying God through our marriages, in this thing called taking the Word of God. And look, you are here for a purpose today. Give 
Like for such a time at this, I was, as this, I was in a meeting when the Gideon representative was here. Brother Jeff, and it's my chance, it's my opportunity to give, to, to help the word go around the world. Point two. Esther's refusal to fulfill her purpose only guarantees hardship in her own life. Mordecai says, For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place, but thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. Running from God only brings hardship to you. First, you miss out. You so miss out. Do you understand what I'm saying? Teenagers, hey teenagers, do you understand what I'm saying? When you give in and when you drop the ball, when you, when you, when you fail to take the baton from the older generation that, that were up here and, and, and we're trying to pass it down along to teenagers and, need, and even before them little kids, look, we got a teenager that's in the sixth grade and he got up in a class the other day in a public school and he preached to his classmates before his class started. That's a young man that has bowed the knee. That's a young man that says, for such a time as this right here, I'm going to get up in front of my classmates and I'm going to read John 3.16 and some verses out of Romans chapter 3 and I'm going to tell them that they need Jesus. And that young man is sitting in this room this morning. God will accomplish it another way and you will miss out. Number two, refusing to accept the baton, refusing to accept the design for your life, that purpose for which God has created you, just guarantees hardship in your own. God says this, Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. He says, I have a wonderful life prepared for you. It doesn't mean that it will all be a, a bed of roses as they say, but He does say that the enemies and the, the attacks and the persecution and the difficult things that you face in this life, when you are doing my will, will be the ones that I choose for you. You run from me, and you're on your own. And the world will eat you up and spit you out, and it will. And you on your deathbed will be the one that says, what in the world did I do? You'll lay in the hospital with death nigh unto your door, and you will look back on your life and say, I wasted it. I wasted it. And I feel for you. I feel for you. What happened to Judas? Judas never even got saved. With Jesus, never never got saved and became the one that betrayed him. And then after the betrayal, he had his money and his 30 pieces of silver and his conscience got to him. And he went back to the high priest and said, what do I do now? What do I do now? I've betrayed innocent blood. And they said, whatever. Be gone. We don't need you anymore. And he went out and did what? Hung himself. The soul that runs from God eventually finds hardness and heaviness, distress, agitation, and sometimes death. The children at Kadesh Barnea went there with Moses. They had been just recently delivered 
from Egypt, cross over into Jordan. There it is, the promised land. It's a, it's a land I promised Abraham, your father Abraham. There it is. It's all yours for the taking. And they said what? They said, mm -mm, we're not going. And God said, fine. You won't go. Then you'll go to the wilderness for 40 years. And every adult 20 years old and upward that's standing here this day will die. And you will never see the promised land. The land that flows with milk and honey. You will never see it. And that's what I'm saying this morning, that when you make that decision, when, when God is saying, for such a time as this right here, I have a work for you to do. I have a design for your life. I have a purpose. And that purpose is going to take... Yes, there will be battles you'll face, but there'll be, there'll be, there'll be battles that I choose for you to face, and there'll be battles that I will fight with you and for you along the way. And we, we stand at the Jordan River and we see. This morning you see. Listen, this morning you see. You know what I'm talking about. You see the promised land. And if you refuse to go in, there will come a time when God says, okay, fine. Fine. Go to the wilderness then. And I understand, look, what causes you to seek your own plan? What causes you? There's a lot of things, but just really quickly. Fear, I understand you're afraid. I know. I get it. You know, we talk about, we talk about declaring the gospel. Is that your theme? Or is that just my theme? Is that your theme, or is that that's that theme, theme the pastor came up with? I'm, I'm not buying into it. When God gives a pastor a theme for the church, guess whose theme? It's not just the pastor's. It becomes the theme for the church. And you will be held accountable for how you devote yourself to our theme this year. Not to me. Not to me. The other day, yesterday, this guy and Greg helped me. We, we went out and there was, there was a lady, uh, Betty Alvis. How many people know Betty Alvis? You know, gave me a lot of books recently from Charles's library. And I'm like, a, I'm like a kid in a candy shop with books, especially old books. I want to know what the, old, what the great minds of old had to say. Far more than I'm looking to find out what Generation Now is saying and how often, and not all of them, but how many of them are rewriting, reinterpreting. Well, they just weren't as, as experienced in the Greek as back then as we are now. Yeah, well, I could preach a whole sermon on that right now. I want to know what the, what the older men had to say. So... She was giving me a bunch of books, and we helped her with a couple things yesterday. And, and uh, so afterwards, I told Damien and Greg, I said, I'm going to buy you lunch. Least I can do for you helping me today. So uh, we went through a local, uh, I'm not going to tell you where it is, because should I tell them? Just say it. <laughs> Doesn't really matter now. Now I've done built it up. It was Bojangles. <laughs> we went through there. And we ordered a meal. First thing they said, it's going to be eight minutes for your, 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 your chicken sandwiches to get done. I'm like, eight minutes? For chicken? You're a chicken restaurant for crying out loud. <laughs> How do you not have it set in there? It's not like I ordered tuna. Eight minutes. Okay. Uh, I, I, I needed a third drink. I don't think you charged me for that. No, so I paid for that when I got to the window. Went around, we parked. I said, well, I'm going to go inside and wait. So I walked inside. I was in there just a couple minutes, and I thought, you know, I went back out to the truck, and I grabbed these tracks out of my truck that are in the console. 
And jokingly, I said to these guys, I said, I'll teach them. I'll teach them to make me wait eight minutes. I'm going to witness to them while I'm in there. I did. I handed the tracks out. But two young ladies were sitting there, and they were workers, and they were on a break. And I walked up, and I said, you know, God loves you. And I said, uh, I want you to read this. When you get a little time, I want you to read this. They're teenagers. Look like, look like teenagers. Um, I want you to read this, and uh, it'll tell you how you can get to heaven. It's been eternity with God. And they thanked me. And I went up and waited longer than eight minutes. <laughs> Liars. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I did wait longer than eight minutes. And when I left, when I left, I walked by the one, and one was still there on her break, and she looked at me, and she smiled really big. And, and you, I could tell that she was making sure to not miss me walking out. And she, and she said, you have a good day. And I thought, I'll have a better day now. She appreciated the love that was shown to her. But, we, but we're fearful about these situations. We get fearful to hand out that tract. We get fearful. We're, we're, we're afraid of losing. Uh, people are going to think I'm weird or I'm odd. And, and, and they will. I mean, they will. They will. But you won't feel weird and odd when you see Jesus one day. When you see Jesus one day having not told a soul about Him while on this earth, you're going to feel, that's when you will feel weird and odd. When you go up to Jesus and you don't have anything. You have no crowns, you have no rewards that you can lay at His feet and say it was all because of you. That's when you're going to feel weird and odd. Oh, you'll have your 70, 80 years down here, and if you live in this church, 90, 95 People live a long time in this church. You can have your time of not being a weirdo. That's fine. But for eternity, you will look at Jesus. And you'll feel odd then. I know it's loneliness. I know that if you take a stand that you're going to... You know, some people are going to walk away from you. Remember when Jesus, look, if they walk away from you, understand this, that they walked away from Jesus. <coughs> Don't just say, well, it's me. It's me. It's not you. It's Jesus they're walking away from. The, 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 uh, 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 the nation of Israel wanted a king. And God says, but I'm their king. This is a theocracy. And Samuel speaks for me. And Samuel says, well, they want a king. And God said, fine, give them a king. And by the way, Samuel, don't you take it on the chin too hard because they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. Yes, there will be ridicule. I know of another high schooler here that carries his Bible to school and is not afraid to show it, not afraid to have it there with his other books. Does he suffer some ridicule? Probably some. Abandonment? Probably some. Does it, fear, does it feel odd to go against your entire life's experiences and open up a whole new door? The one that is for such a time as this? The one that is God has put you where you're at with all of your experiences and, 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 and uh, your, your position, your power, your relationships, whatever. God has given you all those things and He has put you right where He wants you for such a time as this. And, I, and I, I beg you this morning to choose Him. Because choosing the other way guarantees hardship. Guarantees hardship. Where God, you're, look, you're not walking. Yea, thou walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. When we run from God, look, you better fear the darkness. You better fear the shadows of death. Because they are lurking. Sometimes our faith in the pursuit of Christ will separate us from friends. Sometimes our faith in the pursuit of Christ will separate us from family members.
apathy. Maybe it's apathy. You say, well, what's apathy? It means that just I don't care. I just don't care. Maybe that's what's keeping you. But maybe because of that, you're just like, I just find more fun in the world. And you know what? You can find more fun in the world if you're living in the flesh. Because the flesh is what, the flesh is, what is needed to find that fun, that sinful uh, turning your back on God, talking like the world, acting like the world, looking like the world. And you'll find fun. A very temporary fun. But that fun is not the spirit. It is not your spirit that is finding fun. It is your flesh. Jesus says to all that have resented God's plan and avoided God's plan and have run from God's plan and have sought happiness and fulfillment outside of God's purposes. Jesus does say this. Now listen to me. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lonely in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. If you are that person that, have, that has been running, if you're just apathetic, if you just don't, you just seem not to care, if you are fearful and afraid, and that's a very strong presence in your life, Jesus still opens the door up and opens His arms up and says, Come on to Me. Come on to Me. Take My yoke upon you because it's easier than the one you're shouldering right now. And I will give you rest. Point number three. Number one, if you don't do the will of God, if, you, if like Esther, if you, don't, if, you, if, you, if you refuse, unlike Esther, if you refuse to fulfill your purpose, God's going to do it anyway. And you'll be the one that misses out on the great blessing and the great joy and the happiness and meaning and fulfillment. Number two, if, you, if unlike Esther, if you refuse to do God's purpose for your life, you are guaranteeing hardship that God would have never brought to you. Point number three. Esther's refusal to fulfill her purpose would have resulted in the lost opportunity for greatness. And really, I've been all around that this morning. For such a time as this. And she finally said, she finally listened to godly Mordecai and understand the situation she was in as the queen. And there's a whole backstory with that. You should read it. I'm telling you, you should read the book of Esther today and tomorrow. She said, I'm going to do it. And if I perish, I perish. If I perish, I perish. And I'm here to tell you that as the pastor of Clover Hill Baptist Church, we are going to pursue God. And we are going to seek God. And we are going to understand that we were put right here at 3100 Courthouse Road in North Chesterfield County, Virginia for a purpose and a plan. I have mine. You have yours. And I am going to exhort you. I'm going to beg you. I will do whatever it takes to convince you to step in, to convince you to suit up, to, to convince you to armor up for such a time as this. And you too will have greatness. You too can experience greatness. You too will be the legitimate joint heir with Jesus Christ one day in heaven. When God says... You did everything. Yes, you weren't perfect. And yes, you failed. And yes, you had times of, of doubt. But you kept on. And you kept putting one foot in front of another. And you kept opening the Scripture. And you kept bowing the knee. And you kept reaching out to me. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome home. All I have is yours.
Winston Churchill, to every man there comes in his lifetime that special moment when he is figuratively tapped on the shoulder and offered a chance to do a very special thing. Unique to him and fitted to his talents. What a tragedy. What a tragedy. What a tragedy, teenager. What a tragedy, young adult. What a tragedy, young married couple. What a tragedy. Old married couple. <laughs> what a tragedy. Widowed individual. Widower. What a tragedy to say. Won't you say like somebody told me recently that buried her husband not too long ago and she said, God took my husband, but he still has a will for me down here. And I said to her, you ought to preach next Sunday. <laughs> and if I believed in women preachers, you would be. What a tragedy if that moment finds that person unprepared or unqualified for the work which would be his finest hour. Your finest hour is waiting right there. At this time, at this place, for such a time as this, I want to urge you to step out.